Yes, our God is a mountain mover, and you know what? He's still moving mountains every day. And the good news is he can move your mountains too. Hi there, this is Chuck Cooper, host of It's a God Thing radio program. Thank you for joining us today. We sure are glad you're here. You're about to listen to some awesome interviews with believers in Jesus Christ who will tell you how God has revealed and proved himself to them by moving mountains they were unable to move by themselves. They say that their stories can only be described as a God thing. Ready for a real blessing? All righty then, let's do this God thing. Be forewarned, you're going to need your tissues when you hear our guest story today, so you might as well go get them right now. While you're at it, If you know a couple who is facing fertility issues, you might want to call and suggest that they tune in too. They will certainly be encouraged when they hear this heart-wrenching, it's a God thing story today from our guest, Fran Klein. You see, Fran and her husband, Joe, are from Snow Hill, Maryland, where they are members of McKimmy Presbyterian Church. For more than five long, long years, Fran and Joe prayed for a baby. They tried everything imaginable to get pregnant. Bouncing from doctor to doctor, from test to test, from disappointment to disappointment, and from heartache to heartache. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Here to tell her It's a God Thing story in person is Fran Klein. Welcome to our program today, Fran, and thank you so much for your willingness to share your very personal story. I usually don't share prayers, but I did bow my head and I asked God to help me bring back some of the pain that I had felt 32 years ago. So you see, my story is about wanting children desperately. As a very young girl, I always wanted to be a mom. Sure. I would carry around baby dolls and pocketbooks stuffed with everything that a baby needed and <laughs> just pretend to be mommy and loved every minute of it. My mother would tell me these stories often. Well, I grew up and met my sweetheart when I was a junior, really sophomore, it was a sophomore summer in high school. And I finished school and 12 hours after I graduated from high school, my husband and I got married. I graduated at 9 p.m. at one night. The next morning at 9 in the morning, we were at a church oh, saying Lord. our vows and, and got married. Well, that was in June of 72. And come January, um, we had discussed, even though we were very young, that we wanted to be parents. Uh, He had a good job. I had a job at the time. And um, we just thought, we thought the time was ready to become parents. So we were very excited. Well, six months went by and nothing happened. So um, Joe set up an appointment for me at at a doctor's office in Georgetown where he was working. And I went in, and they told me that I was a very healthy lady and that just not to be so nervous, let time take its course, let nature take its course, and everything was going to be fine. And I remember that day just like it was yesterday because there was a flower vendor on the corner, and after I'd gotten out of the doctor's office and we were on the way home, Joe made a huge U-turn, which scared me to death, (laughs) to stop and buy me flowers and tell me that... Oh, yeah, that's neat. Yeah, that he loved me and... And uh, things were going to be happening, and we were just all excited. A true romantic. Yes, he Good. was. He still is. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> so anyway, uh, six more months went by, and unfortunately, nothing was happening. So I went. Our, we went to the general practitioner's office, and there was a new doctor there. He, um, his name was Doctor Ong, and he had specialized in infertility in his um, in his schooling. So we decided to uh, go to him, and he took us under his wing. And even though there was the language barrier, and it was an embarrassing for me, you got to remember I was 19 years old. Mm. 19 years old. So this was very embarrassing for me, but the desire to have a child was so strong. So he took Joe and I in, and through picture books and everything else, he was discussing what was going to happen, what was going to go on. And the first thing he did was give me this chart. And I had to go home, and every morning you have to take your temperature to see when you ovulate, which was a pain in the patoot because (laughs) you couldn't even open your eyes hardly. Everything had to be there, and you took your temperature, and this went on for another year. And still nothing came about. Uh, At this point, I was becoming very frustrated, almost angry. I remember going into grocery stores, and parents would get frustrated with their children. I've even seen the child being slapped because it was not behaving the way the parent wanted him to be. And 
I would just get so angry because I couldn't understand why people could abuse children that way and why some people who looked to me like they didn't even want children had children. And here Joe and I were just striving so hard um, to have a child. So I would come home in tears and Joe would try to console me and I'd get on my knees to my Heavenly Father and, and just bawl, just say, God, why? Why? What? I don't know what to do. I can't do anything. You, you have to intervene here. If you want me to be a mother, you have to help me. My mother, I know I would cry to her every month. My cycle would come on and every month I'd be on the step crying and she'd be, oh dear, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And then I would get angry when people would say it was going to be okay because now it's been three years and it's not okay. Right. And I don't still, I don't have a baby in my arms. I don't have someone to rock. I don't have somebody to share biblical stories or, um, to smell their sweet face. And, um, I was told by my doctor that he wanted to finally do a DNC and when he did the DNC, um, he didn't really, well, I went in to have the DNC done. And for some reason, before they do this test, they want to make sure you're not pregnant. Right. So they did a pregnancy test and it came back questionable. Well, uh, needless to say, questionable to me was oh, on top of the world. Absolutely. <laughs> I've never had questionable before. <laughs> <laughs> so... The nurse stayed with me, and they had to run another test, and I was just so excited. Well, when it came back the second time, it wasn't questionable. I was not pregnant. and Oh, man, another bummer. <laughs> yeah, I was very disappointed, and the nurse there, it was a Christian hospital, and the nurse took my hand, and she said, Honey, she says, time, she says, time is on your side. You're young. You're healthy. She said, Don't, don't give up hope. So I went through the DNC, didn't get the results, and she sent me a beautiful card that I still have to this day in my uh, home frame that I will cherish forever because in the card she she um, outlined her faith. Oh, wow. And gave me hope and, and strength. But the following week I got a call from, from Dr. Ong, and he said, Francis, I'm sorry to tell you that I really don't think you're going to be able to conceive. He said, there's nothing else I can do for you for the basis of, of, of the DNC. He said, um, I, I just, your uterus is totally inverted, and I just don't think that there's anything I can do for you. But I do have a doctor, a Dr. Scardicini, that I've called, and um, he would like to see you. So I continued to pray. I remember one incident um, where my cycle came around and I was devastated because I never gave up hope. I didn't care what people said. People were people. God was God. If God wanted me to have a baby, God could just snap his fingers and it would be there. Absolutely. Uh, so um, this particular month, the cycle came around and then I broke. I broke. After Bonnie, after everything, I just broke. And then with this devastating news and... And I said, God, what can I do? What can I do to bargain with you? I've tried everything else. Okay, I'm going to bargain with you. What can? What do I have that you don't want me to have? Or what do I have that I can give you? Well, I was a smoker at the time. A lot of people smoked back then. A lot more people. <laughs> and I enjoy smoking. I enjoy smoking very much. And so I said, okay, I got a bargain for you. The day I find out I'm pregnant, I'll put these cigarettes down and I'll never have another one. Now, a lot of people tell you not to bargain. A lot of people tell you that's not the thing to do. Well, I was at my wit's end. I was going to do anything. And I know God listened to every word, every prayer, every sentence I had, whether it be negative or positive, because there were some negative things I said. I was angry. So I went home. I went, we made the doctor, we made the arrangements to go see Dr. Scardicini. He was very nice. This was like three and a half years into this venture of um, all these tests and different things, which I've got to tell you, it doesn't make your marriage real pleasant. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. I mean, now the intimacy that you have between your husband is a time clock, a calendar, 
uh, doctors telling you you have to relation have relations an hour before you have to go into to see him to make sure that the sperm is alive, why it's in you. Oh, I mean, there are tests that I can go on and on, and people who are going through it know the tests, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. So anyway, um, I go into his office, and he looks at me, and he says, you're going to be pregnant by your next birthday. Now, this was like, I had just had a birthday. This was like in May. I'm thinking, well, how can he tell me that after a doctor just told me the opposite? Right. And it's the first time he's seen me. Well, the neat thing about him is he was a specialist in infertility. He continued education, and this is what he did. This way, He wasn't a GP that had had education in infertility. He actually specialized in infertility. So he did um, what they called, i got to remember what it was called, shoot, a laparoscopy. And that's a surgery where they take a small scope and they go down to your belly button. And now they can do almost anything. But, of course, he was looking to see if my ovaries and uterus and Mm -hmm. tubes and all were okay. When we came out of the surgery, he told Joe and I that, indeed, I did have an inverted uterus. And that it was sitting on both of my fallopian tubes. That he had never seen this before. But when they tried to put dye through the tubes... It would not go either side. And neither would an egg. And then neither would an egg. And that's where an egg is fertilized right. Right. in the tube. And then it's released and it goes and nests into the uterus. Right. So if that was the case, then I, I could not get pregnant. But he said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. He said, we're going to treat this like a transplant. We're going to have you come in for major surgery. We're going to remove your uterus. And then we're going to put it back in its right place, and hopefully things will mend and heal properly, mm. and you will eventually conceive. And did he give you a percentage of success? or Not, not at that time, oh, okay. because Joe and I had been planning a, a Florida vacation, and it, we had never really had a big, big honeymoon before, and this right. was almost five years of marriage. So we had really put a lot of money into this planning, and we told him that when we got back from our vacation, which was just, just a couple weeks away, that we, we would discuss the details of it. Oh, okay. Well, I called my mother. My mother was hysterical. No, you can't do that. You can't do that, Fran. There are children you can adopt. This is major surgery. Again, you got to remember, this was 33 years ago. Right. So this isn't something that was typically done. Um, And also, I was doing something that was rather odd. I would be waking up um, totally parallel with my hands folded like I was praying. And I was doing that for like months. I would just wake up. Well, Mama said that she thought that that meant I was going to die. I said, Mom, if I die trying to have a baby, so be it. But I am going to do everything in my power to have a child. Wow, what a great story. I don't know about you, but we here at It's a God Thing Radio are both inspired and encouraged and even awed when we hear stories like the one you're hearing today. We think God Thing stories prove to all who hear them how God continues to work every day in the lives of His believers. We also believe strongly that sharing God Thing stories with not yet believers might just cause them to remember similar events in their own lives. Hopefully, those remembrances will cause them to consider that there may be something to God and Jesus after all. Sharing your own God thing story, yes, your own story, is a great way to witness to your family, friends, co-workers, schoolmates, and even strangers. Who won't listen when you begin a conversation by saying, My goodness, you won't believe what happened to me a while back, or... Gosh, I'm so excited about what happened to a couple at our church. Let me tell you about it. Then, tell your own story or share one you've heard here. Doing so just might cause someone to accept Jesus as Savior and Lord. Now let's get back to today's program. So here your mother was a loving mother, obviously, Mm -hmm. and thought she was giving you the best advice, but was being negative when you really needed some positive reinforcement and concerned and worried about the upcoming surgery yes oh that's got to be tough too on top of everything else yes because she was and she was in texas and i was in maryland so she was far away too and you've got to remember i've been crying to my mother now for years and she just didn't know what to do but she didn't want her baby to be hurt absolutely oh absolutely so we 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 went to florida well in florida i was starting to feel different I was, Joe wanted to go water skiing. The fumes were making me sick. 
Um, I was tired. Things just weren't right. I thought I was coming down with the flu. I'm thinking, sheesh, what is going on here? So we get home and I said, babe, I wonder if I'm pregnant. And then I was a few days late. He said, oh, Fran. He said, babe, please don't get your, your hopes up again, please. He had seen me hurt so many times. Sure. Oh, Chuck, if they would have had those fertility tests out now that they have, where you can go to the counter, right. we'd have been broke. <laughs> <laughs> I've thought about that so many times. I'm so thankful they did not have those tests out back then because I would have been picking one up if I was 24 hours late. I would have had that test. Right. So anyway, he says, babe, please. I said, Joe, I really think I might be. Well, again, a long time ago, you had to go take a urine specimen to your doctor, and then you had to wait. So Joe was just so distraught with me. He was angry with me because, mm-hmm. I mean, the two doctors now had told me I could not conceive. Right. So I went to my girlfriend's house. I dropped the urine off, went to my girlfriend's house. I was smoking cigarettes. <laughs> so about, I think they had told me I could call after 12 so I looked at Mary and I put that cigarette out and I said, I'm going to go upstairs. I said, because if this isn't the news I want, I'm going to have to have some time to get over it. I said, I really, I know this is a long shot and I know this isn't going to happen, but, um, you know, I, I want to be myself by myself. So I went up the steps. She had a uh, two story. I went up the steps and I dialed the phone and the nurse said, Mrs. Klein, you're pregnant. I said, oh, oh, no. I said, no, you have the wrong. My name's spelled with a C. It's C-L-I-N-E. It's Francis with an E. You, you have this wrong. I, you, you have to make sure. You, you have to go get the doctor. Go get the doctor. Make sure that I'm pregnant. I, I can't be pregnant. She says, well, Mrs. Klein, you brought the test in. I said, I know I brought the test in. I know I brought it in. I said, but I've been told I can't have a baby. I said, this, this can't be right. So she gets off the phone, she comes back on, she goes, no, Mrs. Klein, I'm happy to inform you that you have conceived a child. I dropped to my knees so quickly, and I thanked God so many times. I thanked him and thanked him and thanked him. I couldn't believe it. I held my abdomen. I I got up. I stood up straight. I, I went back down on my knees again, thanked him again. I didn't know what to do. It was like the earth had stood still, and somebody had just told me that uh, 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 I was in shock. There was no doubt I was in shock. I screamed for Mary, my friend. I remember hitting her first step and her bottom step. I was shaking <laughs> so bad. She said, honey, sit down, sit down. You're going to lose this baby. You can't get this emotional. You got to sit down. Oh, my gosh. I, I, besides the birth of my two girls and, of course, my wedding day, it was the happiest moment in the world. And I'm so glad God felt my joy because I know he also felt my pain along through the journey. So it was nice to know that the joy could be felt, too. You could actually feel his love and his warmth around you. And I still hadn't told my husband. I didn't call him. I didn't want to call him. I didn't want to tell him on the phone that he was going to be a father. So um, I ran into the house and I looked at him and I said, Joe, it's happened. And I remember him just going away from me instead of towards me. I remember him walking back. And I said, babe, you're going to be a daddy. You're going to be a daddy. It's happened. And he just lunged to me then and just embraced me. And he said, oh, dear God, Fran, what? Of what, of what are we, you know, this is, this is something that, that we've prayed for for so long. And I'll tell you in an instant, in an instant, all the pain went away. All of a sudden, it was all happiness. And until really today, when I prayed for the pain to come back so that I could share my story, I really hadn't felt the pain anymore. My biggest concern through all of this, because I have thought about it a lot, are new Christians. I worry about new Christians who are um, having the same struggles, maybe not with infertility. There are a lot of struggles out there. Children who are ill, um, I can't imagine having a real, real ill child, maybe cancer or something. Um, And their faith being new and being so tested. But believe me, if you continue to let God grow in your soul, 
and you do go to church, don't tell people that you can grow without going to church. You can be a Christian without going to church, but you can't grow. And if you don't grow, you can't continually feel the Holy Spirit within your soul. Absolutely. That's important. And, and the Bible teaches that, by the way. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that's very scriptural. Mm-hmm. We are to encourage one another. And that's why I'm so excited to have you on the show today, Fran, because your story is, is going to be such an encouragement to people that are doubting God, mm-hmm. doubting because not necessarily a fertility issue, but they're doubting that God is alive in their in their life and that he's working in their lives, even if they don't even recognize it at this point. But someday they will. Right. Someday they will. It's all. You can also be an encouragement to the listeners who are not yet believers. Mm-hmm. And, and because this is an encouragement, or they may be facing an issue, and all of a sudden they'll look back and they'll say, my gosh, you know, it wasn't me that worked this out. It was it was a God thing right. that worked this out. And certainly in your case, it was a, it was a God thing. So now you had the first child, the first baby. The first baby, yes. All right, and the story gets even better. (laughs) Yes, I have the the first baby, and God did send me to the right doctors. The reason why I got pregnant is when Dr. Scardesini lifted my uterus. Apparently, God decided to keep it there without surgery. And that's why the um, then the dye would go through, and of course the, the the sperm could find its way, and everything happened, and we were all very very happy. Well, two years later went two years, and we decided that we did want to have another child, and as long as it took us to conceive the first one, that maybe we best not drag our feet. <laughs> 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 so. Um, this happened very quickly I was surprised Um, the doctor was surprised I went into Dr. Ong he's the doctor that we went back to then and delivered our firstborn Lisa Ann and um, he said, "Oh, you've got you caught the hang of this, didn't you?" And I oh said, gosh! <laughs> I said, "Well, it must be it must be uh, God's plan because we're we really wanted another baby and and now we're going to have this this baby and we were very excited for this baby also." Um, and everything went well. The, the pregnancy went wonderful. Um, I loved being pregnant. I know that might sound odd, but I loved every minute of it, both times. Well, I, you'd anticipated it for so long. <laughs> oh, I had somebody tell me that I was the most disgusting pregnant woman they've ever seen. They've never <laughs> seen anybody so happy <laughs> being so big, but I was. So anyway, um, everything was going fine, but right before Jennifer's uh, was supposed to be born in March, and right around February, at the beginning of February, our two-year-old came down with this horrible stomach virus. Well, it wasn't 12 hours later that both Joe and I uh, contracted the virus. And, mm. oh, it, I mean, it was it was horrible. I won't go into the details, but believe you me, we were both very, very sick. And to compound pro- problems, there was also snow falling. So it was a, a very scary night. Well, around midnight, Joe called his dad said we need some help well his voice was so weak his father hung up on him he thought it was a prank call and he had to call his dad again and say dad it's it's, me it's me (laughs) you know don't hang up fran and i are in trouble we need your help and they were about 45 minutes away so they got there and joe and i went to they watched lisa for us and we went to the emergency uh, and his stepmom took us to the um, emergency room and lo and behold my doctor was on call my Dr. Ong was on call there. Well, lo and behold. How about that? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> God's will again. Um, and he gave Joe some medication, and he told me I was in early labor, but he did go ahead and send me home. Well, that was a, a, a really bad experience, and about three hours into it, I said, I can't stay home. I don't know if I'm having a baby or just having bad, bad stomach cramps. You know, I've, I've got to get to a hospital. So I called them, and they had me come in. Well, I guess it was the snow and maybe the full moon but there were a lot of women there in labor they were concerned because i had this virus they didn't want anybody to contract exactly so they put me in this room that was really made for doctors to sleep in between um rotations yeah so i had no call button i had a bed and a chair and i was very ill now the nurses would come in periodically pretty often because I was sick and I was under their care but still in between I was by myself Joe they sent home because he was still he had taken taken medication he was groggy and 
I mean, he was in no shape to coach me. And I had Lisa, natural childbirth. That's what I wanted to do. And I wanted to do it for this child too. But it's hard enough to do it with a coach. I couldn't imagine to do it without a coach. And they, they, again, I was in this room and I bowed my head and I said, Lord, I said, they sent Joe home. Uh, They're very busy. I don't even have a call button. You know, I believe in you with all of my heart. You know I do. You know how much I love you. I know how much you love me. I said, but I got to have something I can see. (laughs) (laughs) I I can feel you, but I have to have something I can see and and they can talk back to me. You know, help me. Please, God, please help me. Again, so despair, so much in despair. <clears throat> lo and behold, again, lo and behold, that's my new phrase, I guess. Um, three student nurses walked in that door. I had not opened my eyes. And three student nurses walked in that door. They had wanted to witness a birth. Oh, my goodness. And all three of them were there. And they stayed with me. Uh, my doctor came in and stayed with me. Um, it was one, even though I had been sick, it was just a wonderful experience. I remember sending each of one of them cards and telling them how God had used them and how grateful I was. And, you know, I wanted, I hope that they continued to touch lives in that way. And uh, Jennifer was born healthy and strong. Uh, and again, another miracle. Um, and I am so blessed. And I'm just going to say right now, Heavenly Father... I have thanked you so many times before for my children, for my husband. I cannot thank you enough. And I pray, Lord, for the people out there who have these struggles, please, I know you are with them. We all who are strong in our faith, we know that you're with them. But touch them, Lord. Touch them like you've never touched them before. Help them through their struggles. Help them to know that sometimes your time is not our time. Help us all to help each other, love each other, courage, encourage one another. Help us to show your love in every action we have. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Wow, what a great half hour this has been. Tune in next time for more great God thing stories and tell all your friends to tune in too. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you or someone you know has a verifiable story which needs to be told, please email a brief summary to us at mystory at itsagodthingradio.com. That's my story at www.itsagodthingradio.com. See you next time. Amen.